Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mike Bollinger from River Root Farm here in Decorah, Iowa, tucked up in the in the northeast corner of Iowa. <clears throat> um, Maggie, thank you so much for the invite to come and be able to speak um, in the PFI Farminar. Um, I've done this once before. It was several years ago. And um, as I was trying to wrap my brain around again um, what this is like, I, re I remember the slight oddity of uh, talking in a room where it's completely empty, looking at my computer screen and uh, realizing that virtually there are people out there somewhere, I think, that are listening to this. So um, I, will, I will do my best. Uh, it's an interesting process. Um, I do have the um, webinar chat box um, open down in the, in the bottom corner of my screen as well. So I'll be doing my best to try to monitor that too. So as, as we kind of work through the slides that I put together for uh, this evening, feel free to, to drop any questions into that um, chat box and I will definitely answer those on the fly to the my, best of my ability. Or if it's something that is going to come up later in the um, in the presentation, I will definitely um, let you know that too, and then we'll get to that kind of kind of down the road. Um, a little bit about me, um, this is kind of just my agricultural lens. A little bit about my background. Um, I didn't grow I didn't grow up on a on a farm. Um, I grew up in South Dakota in Sioux Falls, um, and came to uh, to pursue agriculture through a passion that I developed. Um, over a, a number of years and experiences um, with Seed Savers Exchange, living out in the Northeast in Maine, um, had the opportunity to be a steward at an environmental learning center um, that was the former uh, homestead of Helen and Scott Nearing. Um, Katie and I both had the opportunity to be able to, uh, to work with and manage a four season farm with Elliot Coleman and Barbara Damrosh. Um, moved back to Chicago, worked with the Chicago Botanic Garden, um, got into doing some farm development and consulting um, in the Chicago land area, looking at turning brownfield sites um, into, uh, into product, agricultural production areas and doing education with the city colleges of Chicago, um, trying to do kind of urban horticulture development and training programs, um, both for youth and uh, for folks that were um, between the ages of 18 and 25, they were first time felons trying to, to look at programming related to, to agriculture uh, that could keep them out of the prison system and um, doing something more positive. Um, from there, um, moved back to Decorah, Iowa with, uh, with our first child and bought a little acreage and we're homesteading while we um, launched a uh, agricultural manufacturing company that manufactured greenhouses as well as other tools. Um, and also did consulting, trying to work with people to, to kind of shorten the learning curve related to uh, season extension and, um, and growing uh, into the winter. So we did some of that, as well as developed um, some of the first movable greenhouses uh, that were available in the country um, and looking at some of the systems associated with being able to, to do um, you know, more uh, organic systems approach and regenerative agriculture related to, to high tunnels that often doesn't happen um, by being able to plant cover crops and rotate land and, and things like that. Um, and uh, about six years ago, stepped away from that manufacturing business and um, Katie and I decided to give it a go to, to farm uh, organic vegetables full time. Um, and, uh, and we're still doing that. So we're, we're doing something right, I think. Um, so we are on a 20 acre property just inside the city limits of Decorah. Decorah is a town of about 8,000 people um, that also has a small liberal arts college, uh, Luther College. Um, and I'm not sure what the current uh, number of, of students there is, uh, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 uh, students I think it fluctuates between, which is also where Katie and I um, went to went to college and um, and part of how we ended up back in this area to be able to, to raise a family um, we've got about four fenced in acres we do about uh, two to three acres of, of production depending on the on the year um, we've got about 20,000 square feet worth of high tunnels and greenhouses uh, a couple of those buildings are um, are uh, fixed structures or non-moving structures that uh, have rock floors and benches and heat and uh, double uh, double layers of plastic and air inflation to be able to grow transplants and microgreens and we do some of our uh, vegetable washing and processing in there um, 
and and then the rest of the balance of that uh, that square footage is in ground uh, in ground uh, growing structures. So th and those are all low tech structures. Um, they're all single layer plastic. Uh, there's no automation, um, so no fans, no heat. Um, it's all passive solar um, and uh, uh, manual ventilation, things things like that. Um, we primarily sell um, wholesale at the moment. I'll talk a little bit about this as we kind of look at some of the different things that um, that we grew or tried growing uh, into the fall and, and winter months. Um, but as we um, kind of progressed in um, looking at what made sense for us as a family, as well as where the opportunities were um, within our local marketplace, as well as our regional marketplace, um, we found that um, we couldn't really uh, do the amount of sales and business um, strictly locally through farmers markets at, uh, and CSAs uh, and restaurants here. Um, there are a number of very talented uh, vegetable growers here already. Uh, and as Katie and I attempted to, to kind of launch um, our careers in farming, you know, we took a really hard look at um, where opportunities were and where markets weren't saturated. And we'll get into that too. But um, so we, we decided to, to really focus on, on wholesale to uh, food co-ops and, and restaurants. Um, we're selling here in, here in Decorah uh, to a food co-op and uh, a couple of restaurants and a, a kind of a bar and grill. Um, we sell in Rochester, Minnesota uh, at a co-op there. We're in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, with a couple of restaurants there and a food co-op. We're in Viroqua, Wisconsin um, uh, at a food co-op there and a couple of restaurants there. And then we're also sending um, products up into the Twin Cities, um, selling into a, into a distribution hub that is buying directly from us for resale, as well as we're paying them then also to, um, to do deliveries uh, contract deliveries to food co-ops up in the up in the Twin Cities as well. So we're in about um, five food co-ops up in the up in the Twin Cities. Um, sorry, I got to move my chat box here just so I can see what. Um, yeah, so enterprises. We um, this is kind of adapted over time, and it, although we started out very much as a diversified market farm, um, you know, growing. Um, maybe like many of you, you know, almost uh, one of everything in the seed catalogs that you get every winter. Um, and again, as we kind of uh, continued to keep our eyes open as to where the opportunities were, we, we kind of whittled that down um, to, a, to a number of crops that we could grow, again, on a small acreage, but in a higher volume um, and with a better price point and margin to allow us to kind of continue to be on, on, that, small, on that small scale. Um, so some of those things are, um, you know, organic transplant sales. We sell plants out front of our local food co-op, uh, as well as we do all the um, organic transplants for Seed Savers Exchange that they sell uh, through them, their mail order program, as well as the plants that they sell through, uh, through their visitor center in the spring. Um, in our tunnels, we do a lot of tomatoes and cut flowers. We grow microgreens. Uh, we do fresh cut herbs in bulk and in clamshells. Uh, we do a lot of salad greens, which we'll talk about as well, um, and then a hand, multitude of other things. But really, this is that's kind of the focus of of what we're doing on any on any sort of a scale of, of production. Are the things listed there? All right. So as I was trying to kind of figure out what made the most sense um, to to start with, I decided, even though the the conversation is really about greens production, we'll spend plenty of time on that. I I think it's really important to talk about um, season extension and the and the sorts of structures that, that we're using um, because really I, there's there are a lot of things out there now there are uh, lots of different thicknesses of fabric and uh, plastic that you can use on things like quick hoops and uh, row covers that you can put over those there uh, is an in incredible amount of interest in caterpillar tunnels which is what displaceable tunnels here means which are ones that can that can move can come up and you know move from place to place that are temporary that kind of pop into your into your field production um, movable and stationary unheated high tunnels heated greenhouses uh, and you get into you know some of the the additives like 
double layer plastic and air inflation and heat and things like that, which I'm not going to get into a whole lot tonight, but uh, I'll kind of talk about on the on the fly here. Um, so again, as we're we're looking at you know production that's happening you know outdoors <clears throat> August and and September, and as we're getting into to October, thinking about kind of the transitioning of uh, of our our summer season into uh, into fall, and as those temperatures start to to drop. And, and we flirt with temperatures that are hovering around freezing and, you know, a, a, a night where um, you know, we drop into the, into that kind of first time where we drop into the upper 20, 20s and we're thinking about being able to kind of continue on with that outdoor production in the capacity that, that we can so that we don't have to, to move from, from those outdoor productive areas into our limited space and high tunnels uh, in an attempt to be able to kind of go uh, as, as deep as we want to into into the winter and December or January or February, um, depending on the, the scale that you're producing at. Um, really what we're looking at, at starting with, um, excuse me, uh, is this idea of that, that kind of third season extension. So looking at, um, again, outdoor production and, and what are some of the, the kind of minimal investment things that we can do to be able to kind of get us over that shoulder and into into later October before we have to jump into a a more significant structure with with greater in investment. Um, and and really, what I, I think this is a really great slide that came out of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems uh, uh, in North Carolina, and this applies to uh, to season extension whether you're in a building or whether you're outdoors. Right, so this is a set of, of different crops that were all planted at the same time in a high tunnel. So you can see that it's inside of a structure already. And at the bottom, that is a, a planting of those crops that was just planted in the high tunnel. So your high tunnel is your only cover, right? The next one up, you go to a slightly thicker fabric um, and you can see the, the additional growth that you have there. And then if you go to, to the top one, uh, to the top picture, it's a uh, six mil plastic. So it's an even heavier cover where you're, you're holding more of that heat in and you can see um, the amount of the difference in the amount of growth here, right? And so if you apply this to thinking about your production outdoors, right, as we get into some of those shoulder seasons, um, really the, the, the simple takeaway here is that some sort of cover, whether you're outdoors uh, and temperatures are dropping, or you start to move into a high tunnel, some cover is is better than nothing, right? So, and the, and and ultimately, the thicker the cover, uh, the 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 more rapid growth you're going to have, the greater amount of biomass that you're going to be able to harvest. And if you were to look at other other slides that were in this presentation, um, it looks at the the number of days to to first cut. Um, and the amount of biomass harvested, and then the number of days to your second cut, and the amount of biomass that was that was harvested there. And again, as as would follow in the logic of what you see in the pictures here, right? The heavier the material that you're using, the you know the the less number of days to your first harvest, the greater number, the greater the amount of biomass or crop that you're able to harvest out of that first one, the shorter number of days that you have to your second harvest. And obviously, again, the, the the greater the amount of harvestable crop in a in a second cut, and and so on. So again, this is just thinking about being able to to cover those crops as as you're outdoors as well. As well, I think it's really great, really great visual. And then again, there are lots of different covers that uh, that you can use. Um, you get a varying degrees of light transmittance, as well as varying degrees of frost protection. I would say as we're looking at being able to um, uh, to cover crops in uh, with a with a floating row cover in October, um, we're not really so concerned about the light um, as we are uh, the frost protection. I think uh, so. For us, uh, for a, a, a long time, we were using the the Agrabon 19, which it gets at about that four degree temperature difference. Uh, and that works really well. Um, we even use that sometimes in uh, in the summer months, in the warmest part of the year, to be able to provide a physical barrier um, to keep flea beetles off of some of the brassica crops that we're growing. Um, 
But what we found over time is that as we're looking at uh, frost protection uh, and, and reusability, we've, uh, we've kind of jumped to that Agrabon 30. Um, and again, Agrabon, Agrofabric Pro, Typar, those are all just different brands, um, different companies that are producing a, a similar, similar product. Um, so we've found that, that that AG30 works really well for us. It gets you more frost protection, but really the big one is the durability. Um, it's a lot thicker material. So, you know, the first time you go to yank on it and you realize that there's a, um, some ice crystals that have frozen a couple of pieces of the fabric together, you're not going to tear it and, and lose the value of, of that product. <coughs> um, and again, so this is what it looks like. There's lots of different materials that, that you can use in the picture there. That's PVC that's been bent to a, a six foot diameter. Um, there are wire wicket hoops um, that are, are kind of a, a precursor to, to this larger diameter uh, pipe. And again, this is half inch conduit. Um, we're putting those at about a six foot uh, separation between them uh, and then laying the fabric over that. And then obviously you can see the number of sandbags to kind of hold uh, hold those in place. So it's a it's a it's a physical barrier. It's a barrier from the wind. It's a uh, ret it retains heat and it's just a it, kind of that initial um, protection to be able to again extend uh, extend that that outdoor production a little bit. So when you're looking at uh, you know the the low co the investment right really low cost. 13, 14 cents per, per square foot, right? So you can take, you know, a crop of Swiss chard like this and, and throw hoops over it and, you know, and extend that production, you know, for two to three weeks very easily. Um, and, and again, it's a, it's a worthwhile investment in, in my mind for the, for the minimal amount of extension that you get, as well as if you have a high tunnel already or you're looking at high tunnels, it keeps you out of having to, to harvest um, in that in that more expensive invested in structure, right? So you can even you know you look at something where maybe you're trying to get the last crop. And this is this is typically me. This isn't me in this picture, but you know you're trying to get the very last. I have a hard time letting go of those beautiful crops that maybe you didn't get to or you over overproduced on, right? But if you take some sort of a, a protective wire or a hoop and you throw some fabric over that. Again, you can get to this place, and for us lately, the last couple of years, what we're trying to get through is we're trying to get into early November, um, with before we have to that first week of November before we have to jump into into our high tunnels, um, and then again, you know, for these structures, right, you're using them outdoors here. You know, you can use them in the summertime. You could put netting over them to be able to keep birds off of fruits. You know, you can use them with any sort of a cucurbit crop. Um, to be able to keep you know squash bugs off, there's just a multitude of of investment value in in these. Um, so again, in some capacity, I think that this is a great place to start. And again, the value of these all over the farm at different parts of the the year is 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 worth it. Um, but they do have their limitations, and whether whether or not you know it's snow in this picture, um, you know you can. You, the, the reality also is is that when you're um, at this stage. Right, and imagine a, a crop of spinach that was that was underneath. Well, I guess I could even go back to you know to this. You know, the the point at which you kind of have to walk away from this is when when you you're not getting those daytime temperatures where those crops are are able to to thaw. And again, for that, that's us. That's been um, you know late you know late October, and early November. Right. So then from there, what we're looking at, and often again is is kind of a, a buzz. I think as I look at um, you know, people posting on social media and, um, is this idea of what's the, what's that next scale up scale where you're not, you're not ready to put several thousand dollars, um, into, uh, you know, into a high ton, into a bigger structure, you know, but maybe you've got a thousand or $1,500, um, that you want to invest, you know, these caterpillar tunnels are often, um, you know, eight, 12, 15 feet wide. Um, they still are relatively inexpensive. Um, for the gain in production that you get and are again that that kind of next layer of uh, of investment that people seem to be excited about um, you get more thermal gain right which results in more season extension and even then when you kind of have gone past um, the the ability you know when your your daytime temperatures are still low the amount of thermal gain that you would get from from this plastic um, you still have harvestable crops, right? You can stand up in there. It's a much friendlier environment to be able to work on. You know, you take some, a, a crop like spinach that you're producing um, and, and you throw a, a low cost structure over it 
again, you're looking at, you know, three or four weeks worth of extension. Um, you know, you can even go into, you know, this is a hay grove structure that is again, considered, um, and marketed as a three, you know, three season building. It's a, it's a lower gauge pipe. Um, but allows you to be able to get an incredible amount of production as you can kind of see in that, in that top right, uh, picture. Um, again, I, this is, uh, you know, people would say that this is a disadvantage is the disadvantage of this and trying to kind of go too far, um, into, you know, into the kind of late fall and, and early winter. Um, but again, I think that, you know, you're not necessarily on the verge of collapse when you get snow, but a lot of times it's, it's management. And I think somebody that, um, talks a little bit about this and is using these structures in a really great way are uh, the folks at uh, Queens Greens Farm out in New York. Um, and they're taking, you know, their field production, um, they're putting these hoops over and then talk about really what you're looking at is um, is not collapse if you get snow, but uh, but more you just, the, the, man, the management that's involved in this, right? So if you're going to get snow, you're going to, with these sort of low cost structures, you're going to have to be out there you know, pulling snow off of the off of the tops. You know, pulling the snow away from the sides. Um, in a presentation that they gave, they talk about being you know pulling that snow you know about 30 inches off the side of those buildings so that it doesn't start to creep up uh, up the sides. Again, that's just a decision as you're looking at the amount of investment that uh, that you're willing to make, um, whether or not you have the the time or wherewithal to to do that. Um, and then, so looking at, you know, kind of moving on to these, you know, these larger structure buildings, right? Um, reality is you pay, you know, you get what you pay for. Uh, there are, you know, a lot of companies out there selling, uh, you know, products that are, you know, similar in some ways and, and different in others. Um, you know, standard gauge material would be a, for a, for a four season uh, kind of high tunnel or greenhouse would be that one, 1 1.9 inch outside diameter pipe. Um, there are a lot of, uh, buildings out there now, Zimmerman, you know, Zimmerman frames, four season tools, does it, Nolts Midwest produce supply, uh, Nolts produce supply out in, uh, out in Pennsylvania as well that are selling, uh, larger high tunnels that use a, a two and three eighths inch outside diameter pipe. Um, and it's a, it's a lot more material. Um, and so they're, they're, it's a really sturdy frame, but it also allows them to be able to, to, to spread out the hoop. So in, instead of looking at a 1.9 inch outside diameter pipe that are, it's at four foot spacing, uh, you use that larger diameter pipe and you can stretch, you know, that hoop spacing to, to five or, or six feet. Some people are a little bit concerned about that, thinking about snow load. Um, but those are the buildings actually that we're, that we're using as well. So we use that largest diameter pipe. We put them at six foot spacing between our hoops and with the amount of snow that, that we get, we haven't had um, any, any issues. Uh, Gothic frames are the best, Quonset are the least desirable um, for, for winter production. And again, we're just, think, we're just talking about um, shedding snow at this point. That Gothic frame up in the top left, you know, is gonna naturally shed the snow um, as, the sun come, as the sun comes out, as well as you're radiating the heat from the soil on the, on the inside. Uh, that's the shape of the frame that, that we have on our high tunnels, um, just to help you kind of visualize that. Um, and we're not out there cleaning uh, cleaning snow off of, off of those at all. We're not cleaning it off of the, off of the sides either. Um, but definitely as you look at the, the kind of cathedral shape or that Quonset shape, um, you got to really be concerned about or, or aware of any sort of snow starting to pile up on the top uh, and, and along the edges. Um, there's a lot of conversation about fixed buildings and movable buildings. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's beauty to both. Um, and I think it really just, again, depends on where you're at in, in your production system. Um, we started out when, when we started with our, our first building and we were on a much smaller scale. Um, and kind of when we were looking at like a single or two or, you know, two buildings as our initial investment, we invested in movable high tunnels. Um, again, because of the, the flexibility that you gain with being able to, um, you know, plant a crop, uh, grow that crop, you know, start another crop adjacent to it. And I'll talk and I'll show a picture of that later. Um, and then being able to kind of move over. So the, the versatility and the, and the multi-purposing of a building like that, you can put three crops uh, under a, a movable structure in a year. Um, that is a real challenge uh, with, with stationary structures, um, but they're more expensive. So as we have grown, 
Uh, and as we continue to grow, um, we have invested more in, uh, in larger stationary buildings. So going from, you know, 30 by 48 foot, uh, you know, movable buildings. Now we're investing in you know, 30 and 34 foot wide buildings that are, you know, 144 feet in length. It just gets us a, a more significant coverage for a, a, an equivalent price. Um, so, sorry, I just got to move this chat box a little bit. Not seeing any questions coming through, but if anybody's got anything, um, you know, please again, let me know. Um, so fixed and movable, you know, fixed or cheaper movable allows you that kind of multiple season extension. Um, you're going to need strong frames if you're looking at movable buildings. Um, and then you're looking at a, at a price difference, right? So, um, you know, here we're looking at, at prices for stationary buildings, you know, versus then when you get into the pipe skid systems and V track, you can see, um, you know, you, you, you're almost double, uh, the, the investment that you're looking at. Uh, so if we're looking at kind of base costs of stationary buildings, you know, um, you know, you're looking at that three dollar, three dollar a square foot. I did some calculations on the buildings that that we're invested, that, you know, that we're investing in, and I'd say that that's about that's about right. And you're looking at single layer plastic, you know, wooden hip boards, baseboards, um, and and manual ventilation. Um, that's still a again a pretty inexpensive structure um, that has a, an incredible amount of value as we look at this. Um, but the reality is, is that when we, you know, in the manufacturing business and you start talking to somebody, um, you know, you say, oh, well, what about automated, you know, automated ventilation? And, um, what about air inflation and double layer plastic? You know, the reality is, is that those things add up very quickly. The cost of those, um, those automations and metal end walls and polycarbonate and some of those things are, are pretty significant. And very quickly, you can be at that kind of six or seven dollar a square foot. Um, uh, price. We're overwintering. Oh, I'm just going to look at this. We are overwintering carrots and scallions with quick hoops. We're having trouble with voles in our carrot quick hoops. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with pests in the winter? Um, we'll talk about that as we get into it, uh, in the, into this a little bit. Uh, so lots of different movable systems, right? Here are the track tunnels. These are great for people that don't have tractors. You put a track down, um, you anchor those tracks to the ground and uh and then you move the building right uh this is a pipe skid version and we had these for a number of years we had both the v-track and the pipe skid this requires a you know a tractor of some sort to be able to move these but we found that um they're more the, the pipe skid buildings are more economical if you have the capacity to be able to move them and require less uh less work to to kind of maintain around the the tracks and the edges before you move them um, these kind of plug in like like this uh, and then you just got to think about anchoring, right? Because the stationary building, you're putting um, you're putting pipes, you know, 32 or 36 inches in the ground. Um, and since you don't have that, you just got to be really mindful. And the companies I think that are out there that are doing movable buildings now um, pretty, have pretty significant anchoring systems. So I would definitely trust what what they're doing. Um, and this is kind of what that looks like using a cable-based system, where essentially you are anchoring every hoop. You're just anchoring it in a in a different way. <clears throat> All right, so looking at uh, winter production in high tunnels, these are a couple of the 30 by 144s. These are, um, they're about 14 feet tall and, uh, and we have them spaced about 18 feet apart. So really, um, we're just looking at, the, at this kind of transition, right? Warm season crops, cool season crops, you just have to decide what do you wanna grow, how much you wanna grow, you know, when, when and where to grow it and, and how, and kind of how all of these things um, rotate, rotate through. So this is kind of the list of uh, things that we have grown in, uh, in our high tunnels. And what I'm gonna do is kind of talk about each of these uh, a little bit. Um, and, and as we kind of work through it, I'm gonna start with the crops that we have grown that we aren't growing anymore, and then get into the crops that we are growing now and some of the details related to those crops um, and kind of how we decided to make the, the decisions that we have on, on what we're growing. Right, so kale and chard um, were, were crops that when we were in that kind of more uh, diversified um, farm mode, um, when we were growing uh, a little bit of everything, um, you know, kale and chard are crops that um, there has always been a really, you know, kind of big demand for. Um, they hang pretty well outside uh, into October and November. 
um, which means that they also then produce really well um, into uh, you know November and December and, and January in these in these low tech buildings. Um, <clears throat> we grew, you know, winter boar, lacinato, and red Russian for the the three varieties of kale. Um, they all handle cold tolerance really well. Um, Bright lights also um, were uh, were was a variety of chard that that we grew really well. Um, minimum length for a movable tunnel. So, what would be your recommended minimum length for a movable tunnel? Um, I guess I would say that when you when you look at buildings, it's um, I would definitely stay at like a 30 foot width as a as a minimum. Uh, it's kind of a, a standard width. Um, and, and when we're looking at kind of standards, one of the things that we're looking at are what's the, you know, the materials that you get um, for lengths of, you know, purlin pipe, um, lengths of rolls of plastic and widths of rolls of plastic. So I would say 30 foot wide is a, is a really kind of standard size, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of material. And if you're considering wider buildings at that, like jump to 34 foot width, um, you know, there's not, a, again, not a lot of expense. Typically, it's just the extension of uh, of the piece of material up at the very peak of the uh, structure. And I would say 30 by 48 is kind of a, the smallest I would go. Uh, it may feel like a big space you know, right off of the bat, but um, I think you'll find very quickly within a, a season or two that that is going to start to feel small. Um, for some reason, uh, when our NRCS started doing their high tunnel grant program, um, they they stuck with a, a they they put a 30 by 72 as the as the square footage that they were willing to reimburse it's a really odd size um because plastic comes in 100 foot rolls so you ended up having this kind of weird excess of material um so i guess i would stay away from you know that kind of 72 foot length um and i think now nrcs has taken the cap off of square footage so um, you can you can go into larger buildings, but I, I guess I would look at things in like um, you know that those 48 foot length um, adjustments and and 48 instead of 50 because all of the purlins that that you use for those extensions all come in 12 foot length. So you're always looking at adding to buildings in 12 foot lengths. So I would say 30 by 48, 30 by 96, 30 by 144 um, is a really good size. And as we've gotten into our production, you know, we really like that 144 foot. Um, size. Um, wind tolerance on tunnels, I would say, um, again, you just want to look at, um, you know, the bracing, I would say some of the, some of the cheaper structure, um, structures are going to have um, purlins that run the length of the building. So that's that one and three eighths inch pipe that ties in to the, the major structure of the, of the frame or the major part of the frame. Um, but as you can see, kind of in the in the top left um, picture here, you can see the framing that runs across the width at about that uh, up and off the ground, just above Katie's head. That's at an eight foot height. And I would say, as you're looking at wind load uh, and wind tolerance, you definitely want to invest in buildings that have some sort of a you would refer to that as a as a truss kit. Um, so some sort of truss system within the interior of the structure. If you don't have that. Um, it's going to be less tolerant to win. Um, any preference on roll up or drop down? Um, I like roll up sides um, be, simply because the way that the material rolls up, I can just use the standard six mil plastic um, and you can use that all the way across the building. Whereas if you get into a drop down side, oftentimes the, uh, that material doesn't roll down, it more bunches at the bottom. Um, and so you have to, because of the way the bunching and the wear on that, you end up having to use a, a heavier fabric on the side. So you, you, you're using a different material, um, which then adds more expense and also requires more labor, labor during installation. I don't like how the material bunches. Um, although people, uh, like often talk about the advantage of that drop down side being that you're not ventilating at crop height, but I would say that you circumnavigate that by doing ventilation in your peaks in your end walls. Um, if you do use double layer plastic and inflate it, does that help with snow load? Um, it helps shedding the snow. It's not going to allow you to be able to, to hold more snow. Um, it may shed it more quickly because you, you have a greater amount of warmth. Um, but I've kind of um, gotten to the point and I've got a friend that used to be the, the high tunnel uh, 
extension specialist at Michigan State University that's got about 17,000 square feet worth of high tunnels too. And we kind of both agree that if you're looking at extending um, this season, it's not worth the air inflation and that second layer of plastic. There's not enough gain there. You're better off um, looking, focusing on uh, the covering that you use closer to the, to the plants than you are at that double layer plastic. They may, that may help buffer, you know, that double layer may help buffer with wind and, and hold heat a little bit. But again, I don't think it's worth the value unless you're heating. If you're heating the structure, then absolutely you need to do double layer plastic and air inflation. Um, and I don't know, I think, I think this, uh, these slides will be available, so I'm not gonna get in a whole lot, but what I tried to do is put our seeding dates and our transplant dates and, and when we're harvesting. Um, so, you know, for us, if we're trying to, you know, kind of push that production uh, or growth until we want to harvest in, uh, you know, late October or into early November, we're seeding those in a, you know, in a greenhouse. Uh, in, in cell trays on the 15th, we plant those mid-August um, for a harvest in late October. Um, same thing, we would seed early February in a, in a heated greenhouse, try to plant those out in March, looking at, uh, at a late April or early May. Um, yeah, so great. Thanks, Maggie, for that. Um, so one of the things that we also try to do is do a... a is harvest uh, some of those outer leaves prior to the temperatures getting into the low 20s. We find that uh, the, the leaves that produce or that uh, are growing, you know, as we've transitioned into colder weather seem to tolerate that. Um, you know, they're, they're hardened uh, off and, and are more adept to, to those colder climates. Whereas some of those ones that are, that have, that are the, those first leaves um, that have grown in, you know, in September when you get hotter days and it's still in the 70s in your greenhouse um, seem to, to degrade if you hit into those low 20s um, prior to, to harvesting those. So again, I would, I would recommend that plan at a, you know, plan at a density where, you know, they're kind of packed in, but try, you know, plan on trying to have, you know, some, at least some of those outer leaves on all the plants pulled off before you get those temperatures drop into the low 20s. So the question is, do you install wind braces running diagonal uh, from the peak to the hip board at each end wall? Um, so we do that, we did that with our with the movable buildings, um, but we don't do that with our stationary, with the stationary buildings that we have. I would say that that's more of a, a structure, structural integrity thing related to uh, movability than it is uh, to wind or snow or anything like that. Uh, we also grew uh, when we were doing a, a winter CSA and some of those winter early um, uh, farmers markets, you know, lots of different heading crops. I try to, you know, again, I try to put uh, the varieties, all of the different things. And these aren't just, you know, crops that you could grow. These are crops that these are the varieties that we were actually growing when we were doing this. So um, I know there's a lot of new, you know, new varieties and things out there, but these were ones that, that we grew that, that did well for us. So the, you know, as far as the, you know, the Asian greens, the Tokyo Bacana, Joy Choi, uh, that says Nei Ching Choi, that's supposed to be May M-E-I. Indigo is a radicchio, winter density is a, is a romaine variety. Um, and these are seeded uh, a, a little bit later than, than some of the kales and the charge. So we push that back uh, a little bit uh, and for production, it, again, hits right around that transition to, to early November. Um, seeded at the same time, in in the spring so what we're doing is we're starting our transplant production season in early february so anything that we're transplanting into our unheated high tunnels we're starting as early as we can in february and then moving those out as we look at a 10-day forecast that looks tolerant um, sometime in in mid-march to to transplant those out um, here's a method that uh, some folks are doing in order to be able to kind of push their production a little bit. So you know, referred to as a French intens intensive method. Um, this is a combination of Swiss chard and uh, Asian heading greens. So the idea here is that uh, the heading greens are gonna grow more quickly than, uh, than the chard. So as, uh, as things are kind of coming to, to maturity, you know, you're gonna come and you're gonna cut those whole heads of, you know, on the right is Tokyo Bacana, on the left is uh, that Mei Ching Choi. You cut those heads out and then essentially open up uh, production space for the for the chard. So this would be a way of really being able to pack crops in 
um, and 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 get more harvestability out of out of your square footage. So we've never done this here, but this is something that uh, that Paul and Sandy Arnold uh, out in New York um, that, uh, have have done and talk about in some of their presentations. So I think it's worth talking about that. Um, so carrots and turnips are another thing. This is, you know, when we were using, you know, the movable buildings, that top right picture um, is, a, is kind of the perfect example, right? So in the structure, uh, kind of set off behind these carrots are, uh, our tomatoes and peppers are growing. And then in this outdoor plot uh, adjacent to the high tunnel, we would seed our, um, our carrots on the, on the 15th of August. And uh, and then come late October or early November, you know, once those tomatoes in the unheated um, structure weren't producing anymore, um, we would then, you know, cut those down from the truss system and then slide that over uh, our carrots and harvest those into as long as they were gone. And we're in a, we were in a place then with, with a lot of these things, with the amount of square footage that we had, it was, um, you know, I think initially we were like, oh man, we can go. You know, we can sell our stuff all winter long. It'll be really great. And I think the reality is, is that it's, um, we've, we've been putting up, you know, the equivalent of a building every year. And every year when we expand, we run out the same time. So even though we could, we could be producing straight through the winter, it's hard for us to make it past Christmas, even as we have continued to, to expand our, our production. Um, Mokum is the, um, I think, you know, it's the, it's the, the only carrot that we grow for bunching. Um, all season, I know it's considered an, an early, you know, an early market carrot. Um, you know, we grow Bolero for field carrots uh, for for storage, but if we're doing any sort of fresh bunching carrot, I just the the, sh the shape of of that variety uh, and the sweetness of it is exactly what people uh, picture in their mind when they're thinking about the best carrot that they've ever had. Um, so yeah, seeding those in in mid August. If you're looking at trying to kind of produce pat or push production, say you have multiple, you know, multiple high tunnels and you're kind of, you know, working with a set of crops and you, you know, you want to be able to go into to January or February, you can definitely push, you know, push the dates on, uh, on those crops of when you're direct seeding them and when you're transplanting them um, farther back with the reality that, um, that as you, you know, as you do that, you're, you're pushing your production into, um, you know, into, into January. So the dates that I'm giving you um, in those previous slides are for, you know, trying to hit maturity right around that transition from, from field to, to high tunnel. Um, and, you know, planting, you know, this date sometime, somewhere between September 1st and October 15th, you're looking at production that you're trying to push into January, February, and, or even just even hold over winter to then, you know, that February and, and March production. Um, but the reality is, is if you want to have something that you're overwintering for early production, you definitely you can't do it after November 1st. Um, so whatever you're doing, definitely, uh, definitely plant it before, um, before then. All right. So our focus now, uh, our focus now is to sell out of things as quickly as we can. Um, and for that reason, um, and again, because we've also transitioned into, into that wholesale production, we needed to use our high tunnel space to be able to really focus on kind of building up the, the volume of, of greens. So we now, uh, we now grow these five things um, in, in all of our high tunnel space um, in spring, then transition uh, outdoors into the you know, late spring, summer, fall, and then back into these same crops in the, you know, in the late fall and, and early winter. Um, these are all things that we pack into five ounce clamshells, as well as sell to uh, food co-ops and restaurants in, um, in bulk. So the really the goal for us and the kind of streamlining that we've done and the reason that we've picked those crops is that when we were looking at where the opportunities were to be able to work with additional uh, you know, wholesale accounts, um, we were trying to not grow the same things that uh, folks were already growing in our area and in our region, but um, kind of moving into things that were still throughout the course of the year being brought in from, you know, from California and, and Arizona as, as Greens Productions focuses there, which is why we're doing uh, those five ounce clamshells and, and bulk. And so, you know, you go into a store 
and you see you'll see a you know a 50 50 mix which is half salad and half spinach you'll see spinach you'll see a lot of times baby arugula and baby kale um, and and so this is kind of our our version of, of those so baby kale and, and arugula um, we're seeding those the the 20th of September we seed that once in the once in the fall um, and then that production kind of comes to maturity in early November and then as we um, as you move through November and into December um, those temperatures drop so we leave if we think about that early slide from the Center for Environmental Farming Systems uh, right about the amount of growth that you get um, were the, the growth slows right and so part of what we do to be able to control growth um, in the greens that we're growing um, isn't by doing multiple plantings but deciding how uh, when we're going to cover our crops and and how many layers of fabric we're going to use so we our, our growth slows significantly in early November and and then we start to layer um, the fabric onto onto these crops to to hold them at a at a size just as the temperature really stops starts to drop into the low 20s and teens and beyond um, so we're you know we're seeding both arugula and baby kale on the on the 20th um, we pushed it to the the 24th this year because we were uh, we were planting these after some tomatoes were going out um, and and it was right it was kind of right on the verge of being too small because we had a cold snap right at the end of October um, but that's, that's, so that's kind of right there. And you're just realizing that if you're going to, if you're pushing past that September 20th date, um, which I really, I really hate to do. I mean, you're at a place where you're, you're looking more, uh, you know, it, you know, two or three or four days, you know, on the back end for maturity, you're looking at, you know, you know, two or three weeks difference. Right. So, you know, if you planted those on the 27th, you might not get them till Thanksgiving. Yeah, so four, four uh, yeah, four row pin, pinpoints here is what is what we're using. So mighty mix is our is our mescaline mix. Um, the varieties that that we are growing in our winter tunnels are koji, which is a green choy, rosy, which is a red choy, uh, red kingdom is a more of a broad leaf red mizuna, um, amara is a mustard and shungaku is a chrysanthemum that has kind of a celery taste um, and is really awesome and that's what that that amara is the is the bottom right picture there and this these are grown the same you know same timing uh as the arugula and the baby kale and actually depending upon you know how sales are coming through and how our production is happening you know that baby leaf arugula and the baby leaf kale um may you know may get mixed in to to this mighty this mighty mixes as well um we've tried a ton of varieties of uh of different brassicas uh in the winter and um we've kind of settled on these varieties because we we like the taste uh we like the disease resistance we like how they how they hold as temperatures you know hover around zero degrees um, you know, for a while we tried growing, you know, Mizuna cause it seemed to be a standard mix that you would see in, uh, you know, Taylor, you know, Taylor farm greens and earthbound and some of those, some of those other products. Um, but that breaks down, um, much more quickly as temperatures start to get into the teens. Um, and, uh, and so we've kind of moved away from that. So these are varieties for us that just are are just awesome. Um, we haven't ever, we don't, we don't have, we don't see any degradation with, you know, with these varieties as, you know, you hit, you know, negative five, negative 10 degrees uh, outside. These things hold up just fine. The regrowth is nice. Um, you know, again, great disease resistance. So with these varieties that we're planting at a 12, just to answer Rose's question, um, we, uh, we are using overhead irrigation for, um, for these densely planted crops. <clears throat> and then uh, as we get into some of the lettuce, I'll show you we're using, we're using drip irrigation, but overhead irrigation simply because um, for us, we get a better stand um, when we're direct seeding these crops into the, into the high tunnel. Um, and then for us here, um, on the, the picture on the right is our outdoor production. Um, so you can see there that that those varieties are all blended together. 
Um, and we used to do this in our, in our high tunnels as well. But again, as we were trying to work out what varieties did well and what varieties didn't do well, uh, if we had something that, you know, a, a variety that started to degrade and they had it, we had it mixed in with everything, um, that's a problem. So what we do is that now in our field production during the year, we're mixing all these varieties together. But then as you can see on the left, uh, when we transition into, into our tunnels, we're planting all of those, uh, all of those crops individually. Um, are your baby varieties bred seeds as baby or do you just cut them at a small? Um, I think any of these can be grown at a, to a, to a larger size, but definitely um, like in the, you know, in the specifications um, of these varieties, they talk about them being used for baby, baby production. So I don't know if they're specifically bred for that, but um, okay. So then uh, moving on to lettuce greens, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very similar. The, the dates for seeding are, are slightly different. You know, lettuces take a little bit longer to germinate than do the brassicas. So, you know, that's jumped up about a week, um, but we're planting it on the same density. Um, for us, we chose the varieties here, which are significantly more expensive than a lot of the more common varieties um, that you could grow during the summer in the field. Um, specifically to be able to address uh, disease concerns. So looking at, you know, botrytis and powdery mildew or downy mildew, things that relate to cold, you know, cold temperatures and, you know, moisture lingering um, with something as densely seeded as what you see in these, in these pictures. These vari those are, these are varieties that um, really held up for well, well for us as we, um, as we kind of, again, experimented. Um, but within the last two years, uh, we switched to growing Salanova. Um, we grow all eight varieties. I know there's a lot of conversation out there about, uh, and pictures of people saying, oh, I don't like this variety or I don't like this, you know, this variety or, um, you know, for us, you know, or the, you know, some people don't think that the, the weight that one of the varieties, is, you know, a red crisp is as good as, you know, a green crisp, so they don't grow the red or, um, I don't know, there's all different kinds of reasons, but we grow simply just all eight varieties of Salanova all year long. Um, we seed them the 7th for our high tunnel production. We seed them on the 7th of August and we transplant those out on the, on the 14th. Um, we give them about five weeks to grow. Uh, and then the same thing, we seed them early February, um, plant them out in March. We're planting these four rows on a, on a 30 inch bed. Um, so again, thoughts on Salanova, part of the reason that we moved away from baby leaf salad greens, uh, direct seeded to, to these is, you know, it's a high yield. They're, they're a heavy, heavy weighted uh, leaf set. They're really cold tolerant, you know, unmatched vis visually. You have reduced weed concerns um, with, uh, with the heading lettuce, so they're easier to weed. Um, you're a little less reliant on, on that kind of early, you know, early bed prep. Um, you know, handled for us over the last couple of winters, you know, any of the, any of the issues that, that we could see with crown rot or botrytis uh, haven't really been an issue. Um, and then these are just comments on, on varieties. You know, green sweet is, you know, is definitely the highest yielder. It has incredible regrowth. Um, so we grow probably more of that than we do the others when we're looking at our winter production again for the, for the weight. Green and red butters, uh, you know, I read, just read something recently. People didn't like these for winter production. I love them, but the regrowth is really, uh, really poor. So it's kind of a, a single, uh, single harvest weight. But, um, but again, the weight that you get from that early crop is really nice. So I'm not going to go through, talk through all of these, but there's some, some notes there. Um, so this is production uh, happening for us on the left. So we run 30, 30 foot wide building. Um, four or eight, eight beds, four rows per bed. Uh, and then we run drip irrigation for, for these. Uh, I think the picture on the right is also interesting and something that we're considering moving to too. So this is Brian Bates and his wife up at Bear Creek Organic Farm in Michigan. Uh, and they're, they're solid planting uh, their entire building. So they're, you know, whereas you would see in ours, there's walkways there um, in between all of those. They're, they're not bedding up that area. They're just, they're planting that solid. Um, which they've said is about a 20% increase. So we're looking at that. I just haven't wrapped my brain around how I would actually do that um, planting wise. And then spinach is the other thing that, that we grow. Um, 
So we direct seed those a little earlier on the on the 10th of September, uh, and then again February once in February, once in March. We only grow six rows on a 30 inch bed. Uh, direct seed these with a with a four with a four row seeder. Um, seaside, so space is what we do in our in our winter tunnel. It's the only variety we do in the winter tunnel. Seaside, Calibri, and Lakeside are all uh, early, you know, or spring, summer, fall varieties that that we've experimented with. Um, outdoors to be able to run spinach through uh, through the summer, I would say Lakeside is my is my favorite of those. That's from Osborne Seeds. Uh, and again, so this is the thinking about solid block planting and the increase in production, right? So they this is Queen Greens in New York, and they solid block plant um, these and then and then harvest and work their work their, their way through, um, which is looks awesome. Again, you can delay planting if you're trying to not have availability in, in November, but you're trying to push that into December if you have crops that are phased through. Um, and but again, just you got to plant those by by November <clears throat> by November first. Uh, so getting into the not only the what we grow, but also how. Talking a little bit about our production. So for us, in order to be able to run these transplants, um, you know, in early February to plant those tunnels early, as well as you know, have a space to be able to grow crops. Um, we've got heated heated high tunnel space or heated greenhouse space. These are use the same sort of truss system, but these are double layer air inflated uh, and with fans. And we do that because we're we're heating. So we have a we run a lot of transplants through our buildings in the in the spring, and that uh, that we do for for wholesale and resale, and then also our own our own transplants. So you just got to decide how many plants do you want, when do you want them, how long will it take to get them. Right. Uh, as we've scaled up, we've moved from hand seeding to vacuum seeders. Uh, we're using germination chambers to be able to um, speed up the germination in in those spaces early on, and to be able to get really nice and even germination. Um, and you can see here, these are Salanova varieties that we seeded on looks like the 19th of February. Um, so these are coming along, and these are just about ready to to put out. Bed prep, we uh, we can't we don't bring a tractor into the into the high tunnels at all. So we're using a BCS um, and, and rakes and seed bed rollers. Um, fertility management, again, we're using this space so intensively um, that it's really important to use to to soil test. We soil test every year um, and and do our um, you know, do our fertility management based on what information we're getting back there. But the reality is, is that salad greens are a short season crop. They don't require a, a lot of fertility. Um, and I would say, you know, some of these recommendations, you can, this is a good chart that was put out by DAC Cap in Wisconsin. So looking at, you know, Asian greens, lettuce and chards and spinach, right, based on the percent of organic matter that you have, um, you know, what you're looking at as a, as a, as a rate of application of your, you know, your macronutrients. Um, so, you know, some of these varieties that you're looking at, you know, hundred. So if you look at that uh, lettuce, you know, they're saying, you know, hundred pounds, hundred pounds, hundred pounds per acre and equivalent, um, you know, we're using now because we're turning these buildings over so, so often, you know, we're using, ha we're using half that. Um, so we're only applying um, about 50 pounds in per, uh, per acre equivalent. Um, and we're doing that, we're splitting that also, because I've read a lot of information about just um, as just you know, nitrate uptake um, and in crops, especially as you look at potential toxicity related to, uh, to spinach. And one of the things is fertilizing less and, and more frequent as opposed to, to front loading so heavily. So what we do is when we prep our beds, if we're putting in, oftentimes the fertilizer that we're using is just a comp composted poultry manure, um, which has, and this is in here, it's about a 45 day release and takes about seven to 10 days to activate. So what we're doing is when we're working at beds to, to get them ready, um, we're applying half of that uh, at the time of, of that prepping. And then, and then we water that once before we tarp it. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then when we pull those tarps off, flame it and get ready to plant, we're actually then um, applying the, the the second half of that, which staggers that release. Um, so yeah, 
Um, this summer we had plastic pulled off of two of our buildings um, and we uh, took advantage of that and put some buckwheat cover crops in there. This is something that we're trying to integrate more in our, um, in our longer stationary high tunnels. Um, as we add buildings, what we're the, the driver of, of the additional buildings is our season extended greens production, not our summer production. So we often have uh, buildings that are empty in the summer. And so what we're doing is we're cover cropping those, uh, those structures during the summer months. Um, for us this year, we just didn't have to irrigate it because uh, the plastic blew off. So um, that's again, something that we're trying to integrate to, to affect how much uh, fertility we're having to, to add and how we're able to, to keep up those organic matter levels. Um, using a bed shaper, a uh, really low tech bed shaper on the back of a, of a BCS. Um, we're using silage tarps to, to kind of smother out that first flush of weeds. Um, this is a chart that just looks at essentially as saying the uh, greater the number of weeks uh, of solarizing, uh, the less relative matter that you're having to deal with as far as weed matter um, in, uh, in your production. So after we pull off tarps, then we're coming back with a, with a flame leader. Um, just a quick run over that. And then we come through and seed uh, with a four row pinpoint seeder. I, I know that there is, a, you know, there are a lot of other seeders out there and some of the more uh, kind of visible people on, you know, on social media are using the, the, the gang, uh, jang seeders. And that looks great, but I, um, I'm just not at a point where I'm ready to, to spend you know, that kind of two to $3,000, the four row seeder still works really well for us in, in this space. Um, I can see the seed drops and it's easy to, uh, to manipulate um, in switching between the different varieties of things that, that we're planting. Um, and again, this is just to kind of reiterate and hit again on, <clears throat> uh, you know, fabric, some fabric is, is better than no fabric. And there is again, that chart that we saw earlier on. We've tried a lot of different ways um, to cover to cover the the plants with the floating row cover this is a picture of us you know just d laying the fabric directly on uh on the crop um we've used quick hoops with that six foot diameter and kind of hauled those in you can see katie you know smiling moving a, a stack of those in there um but we've come back to the come back to the wire wickets uh the the most economical of all the things it requires a, a little bit more work although not a lot more work um, maybe 10 minutes per, uh, you know, per 4,500 square foot building to be able to put these in. Um, and we put this over every single, every single planting bed. Um, part of the reason that we have done this is that it keeps, um, it keeps the fabric much closer to the crop, which means that we're holding more heat in. Um, and as you think about, you know, sleeping with a blanket, um, you know, you, you'd rather have a blanket close to you or, or almost touching you or actually, well, it's always touching us, but, um, you know, the closer, the better essentially. Right. Um, and so we like these wickets because they keep it really low. And the fact that we have all these touch points along the, along the length of the, of each of those beds, it makes it really easy for us to be able to pull the fabric on and off in, in these large. So we use solid sheets of fabric of that AG30 to be able to run those 144 foot buildings. And we can really yank on those and they don't, um, and because they're so close together and they're low to the ground, it makes it really easy to kind of pull those on and off. Yeah, so six foot spacing between those as well, yep. And that's easy for us because our, uh, our hoops are spaced at six feet. So we're just going, you know, at, at each hoop of the, of the high tunnel frame, um, we're, we're dropping those in. So harvesting. You know, uh, knives, we use a lot of knives. Um, we, have the, we have the greens harvester, and then, we, and then, you know, may at some point scale up to this Sutton Egg Junior Harvester, um, or Ortomec makes a really nice pull behind harvester. But in our, uh, in our high tunnels, we're really using a lot of, a lot of knives. Um, because we want it to be able to kind of take advantage of, of nice regrowth, we find that using knives and because we have a little bit more time because we're harvesting in uh, we have a little bit more limited harvesting because we're just in the high tunnels that we have the time to be able to come through and harvest with a knife and really do quality control as we're going through. We're cleaning up any, um, you know, any debris and things like that. We get a nice clean cut, which means nice, nice clean regrowth. And I just don't think that you get that 
um, with the with the greens harvester that's pictured on that bottom left, that quick cut greens harvester. Um, and that's all I got for you. And we're at 12 after. So um, thanks for coming along in the discussion. If you have any questions, please let me know. We've got about 15 minutes or so to be able to, to kind of talk through anything. Hope it was worthwhile for you all to, to be here and participate in this. All right, thanks, Mike. So yep. I wanna, before we take any of the questions that are lingering at towards the end of the chat box, there was a question early on in your presentation from Carly and she asked, we're overwintering carrots and scallions with quick hoops and we're having trouble with voles in our carrot quick hoops. Yep. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with pests in the winter? Yeah, so we we do see a little bit of pest pressure, but I would say and we're setting out just really simple, just really simple traps um, right along <clears throat> right along the edges of those densely planted beds. Um, but other than that, we're we're not really doing uh, we're not really doing a lot. We don't we don't. Um, I've definitely seen people taking like a you could take a you know a larger tube a piece of PVC or something like that and kind of run that in your walkways or along the edges of your high tunnels and, um, you know, and then putting traps in, in there. Um, we don't, we don't even go that far. We just put traps out um, right along the edges of our, of the production areas. And then again, we're just kind of harvesting, you know, harvesting through um, things and trying to clean up any, you know, any, any debris. So we're just trying to, to outpace them, I guess. Super. Um, and then there was another question. Someone, Eric, wanted to know, are you planting all your transplants by hand? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're planting them all by hand. And I should have put, I should have put a picture in there. Um, this, la you know, look, this last fall, um, we've got a local kind of um, community list serve uh and often there's just a lot of chatter about oh you know people either you know looking for work or looking for side jobs or have got some free time or all kinds of things right so um what we do is when we have kind of some of our larger transplants uh transplant set outs that we're doing we're um we're just kind of sending out an email blast and and we often get you know seven or eight people that'll come and uh and help us with that which makes planting these tunnels really you know really fast we can plant you know, 4,500 square foot with, with lettuces, um, you know, within, within a couple of hours. So more hands, the more hands, the better. Sure. Um, and then Ann Novak wanted to know, what about uh, the brand of your four row cedar? Yeah, it's a pinpoint, pinpoint cedar. And just a reminder to everyone that's um, attending and wants to ask questions, make sure in your chat box, you switch your to field to say all panelists and attendees or everyone. I know that there's two different options for some people, but make sure it says all panelists and attendees or everyone. Otherwise, Mike and I are the only ones that can see your questions and comments as they pop up. Yeah, so and then a question from Rose. Yeah, we are we Rose, we are washing all of our greens as well. So we we double we double wash those. Um when, oftentimes when they're coming in from the high tunnels, they're much more cleaner than what we're getting from the field, but we'll run those through a through a double sink washing system and then run those in a through a through a spinner to be able to to dry those well. Um and then I know some people kind of set those out and let them air dry with fans. We're not going that far. We're just we're bagging those up um, into into big bulk bags like you had seen uh, earlier, and then those sit um, in you know in our walk-in cooler until we're ready to to package those, and then we spread those out on a big packing table. Uh, and as we're packing, they dry a little bit, but they're pretty they're pretty dry by the time we put them in the bag to try to minimize some again some of that degradation that happens. Um, Christina asked, have you worked with any berry crops under high tunnels, raspberries, strawberries, any others? I, I have not worked with, uh, with any, so I can't talk with any significant detail to that. Um, although anecdotally, um, I would say that, uh, that there's definitely, um, significant interest in it and there are definitely people that are doing that. Um, and, and one of the advantages outside of any sort of, uh, potential 
uh, slight extension of, of season is really the minimization of botrytis. So your, your harvestable yield goes up considerably by being able to, to put it in a controlled environment like a high tunnel. So this is slightly off topic, but I'm gonna ask anyway. Um, as you scaled up, I'm curious about your planning and organization of how do you keep track of what you're planning in each of your spaces and just the timing of all of that? Has that been a, a barrier or a hurdle that you've had to work through as you've scaled up in production size? Um, yeah, so I would say, yeah, I mean, it's always, you know, it's always a challenge, right? When you're working with a limited, you know, with a limited space, Part of the way that we addressed that early on was with the movability of the structures. Um, and then as we moved away from movable buildings and into stationary buildings, part of what allowed us to be able to build, you know, the rotation of how we move things through for spring production, summer cover crops, and into fall and winter production um, is just by having larger, you know, larger spaces and multiple buildings. Um, to be able to to rotate those things through and so like with most things I mean we we just have to sit down and and kind of map that out I mean I had um, had I had more time I would have definitely gone into that this this slideshow originally was about a hundred and hundred and sixty <laughs> slides and I cut it down to about 85 slides to fit the fit the time but um, a lot of those just go into the different spreadsheets that we use and okay. to be able to kind of rotate things through and how we're doing that so that yeah essentially by the time that we're ready to to kind of flip the switch so to speak in the spring um, we we have all of that stuff kind of planned out and we're just we're following through on the on the timeline that we've built early in the season We'll just have to have you come back again and explain yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can definitely, yeah, we can definitely get into that. Um, um, there are a couple more questions there if you want to go through those. Sure, yeah. So, um, sorry, I got to scan up a bit. So, we have problems with ceiling drips in the winter. Um, so, there, uh, there are different additives that can go in the plastic to help um, address the, the dripping. Uh, and so I would look at or talk to whoever you next time you're switching your plastic out definitely um, You know look at you know that the different additives There's a, an IR plastic that is supposed to be like an anti drip and kind of more of a light dispersing plastic would would definitely help As well as I would say um, you just got to be really conscious I mean, if you've got moisture dripping it means you've got a, a Quite a bit of moisture in your building and you just you want to get that out anyway so that you still start to deal with uh, potential disease issues. Um, so ventilating, you know, ventilating those buildings as, as best you can, you know, when the sun's out, um, you know, trying to, trying to kind of keep those, you know, keep those vents open as much as you can. And that's where, um, you know, having those, having those vents in the, in the peaks really go a long way. You can see that in the, um, in the picture on the left on this last slide, that's still up actually. Those, those are aluminum shutter vents, which I don't recommend at all because they're pretty flimsy. Um, but some sort of ventilation up in that upper uh, kind of peak goes a long way to letting out the heat, but also because you're so close to the plastic then there too, you're, you know, with any sort of a, a breeze or air movement coming through there, you're, you're helping to dissipate the amount of moisture buildup that's on that plastic. Uh, can you speak on your bulk bags a little more? Um, yeah, so we're just, we're buying, um, uh, we're buying those from Uline. It's, uh, can't remember it's a it might be a one or a 1.5 mil um bag i don't have the specifics on that in front of me but if you wanted to email me um just mike at riverrootfarm.com um i can get you the specifications on on those on the bags that we use and if you're interested in the containers that we're using too i can i can show you that um we're actually switching over i'm excited we're switching over to a 100 percent um compostable uh clamshell for those moving forward. So that's kind of kind of exciting too. And in addition to that, um, somebody earlier asked about how to get a hold of your slides. So if you could send those to me, Mike, I'll send an email out to everybody that was in attendance and I'll make sure to include your email so that it is readily available for anyone that wants to follow up with you on those details. Yeah, that sounds great. 
Uh, so question from Kelly, do you use any rain catching systems to help with water use and just having better water, let me see, water quality? Um, we, we don't at the moment use, um, any sort of a gutter system on, on our tunnels. Although <clears throat> I would absolutely love to do that. That's kind of one of those big picture dreams to be able to do that, especially as we're getting more, um, <coughs> excuse me, more, you know, more buildings with a larger surface area and, and the capacity to be able to catch more water. Um, in fact, there was a guy that when I was uh, working with Four Season Tools um, that bought a building from us and we designed a gutter connect or a gutter system to be able to catch the water that comes off of those that's integrated with your hip board. So rather than doing a hip board and adding gutters, it's an integrated gutter hip board. Uh, that's a, that's really nice. And he was putting um, he had buried a 20,000 gallon bladder, um, uh, under the ground so that he could run, uh, he could run the water from all of his greenhouses as well as his roofs into that to then use that for, uh, for recirculating for, for irrigation, which was really awesome. So we're not doing it. It's definitely out there. We would love to do that. We just haven't yet. We're closing in on 8.30. Does anyone have any last questions? Anything they want to bring up before we close out? Yeah, so I would say build your own. Um, you can use right angle, you know, so if you're building a, <clears throat> if you're building an end wall um, out of like two by fours, you know, I would just use two by fours um, to build a, you know, to build an interior vent and use the same sort of, you know, we would screw um, plastic of attachment channel around the four corners of, of the wooden frame and then just wire in the same greenhouse plastic. We would put that up into the peak vent and then we would drill a hole large enough to be able to push a half inch uh, electrical conduit through the vertical frame through the vent and we would slightly off center that so that it was weighted so that it would close on its own. Uh, and then you would just use ropes, uh, you know, I hooks and, and, and a simple S hook to mount that on the interior. And then you could open, you know, open those vents with that and then, and then rope it, you know, rope it open or rope it closed. Um, that's much more, much more economical than those aluminum shutter vents are. And they'll definitely hold up to, um, they'll definitely hold up to uh to the to the weather better than those aluminum shutter vents well those are always kind of cackling and any sort of wind um seem to kind of flex those a little more than than you would like uh trays to start seed so we um we inherited a bunch of trays from we had used soil box for a really long time and when a farmer friend of ours um it was retiring he handed off a bunch of his trays as well as his vacuum seeder so we we didn't specifically choose what we were doing. It was based on some of the things that infrastructure or the things that we were inheriting. But 128s, um, we've you know we've done a lot of like uh, those the transplanted greens like the Salanovas in you know 50 cells, 72 cells, 128s, uh, and 128s seem to as long as you keep them watered and and you know and you have the fertility in the potting soil um, seem to produce a really good you know really good uh, transplant that grows quickly you know when you're working with any sort of a cell tray rather than like a, um, a soil block part of the challenge is getting the plant large enough to fill the cells you know for this for the plant to fill the cell with roots so that when you're pulling it out you know you don't just get a, a crumbling ball of, of soil and loose roots um, I haven't tried wind stri wind strip trays but if I were starting from scratch yeah I would definitely uh, definitely do that people kind of kind of rave about about those and i think the quality of the of the tray itself uh is good it's a little thicker plastic so the longevity of those is is good too and i think connor crickmore right from i don't know if this is true or not i think i heard this though that connor crickmore from never sink farm didn't he is he's involved with wind strips now and so you can source them more easily i think than than you used to be able to all right, and then maybe we'll take Eric's as our last question. He asked about, have you pulled main plastic during the winter months? And is there a minimum temperature you recommend for putting plastic on? Yeah, so we've definitely pulled plastic in the, in the winter. Um, and what I would say is 
Um, again, obviously you do it on a calm day, but I, if you're going to do it in the winter, I would also do it on a sunny day. Um, stretch the plastic out on, um, out on the, you know, on the snow or on the ground and, um, and let that, you know, kind of sit in the sun a little bit and a little absorb that and kind of soften a little. And then again, as you pull the, as you pull the plastic over that building to then wire it on, you know, you're also going to get, you know, heating from that as well. Um, that will help kind of uh, soften that plastic a little bit so that you get, you know, that you get that kind of nice kind of taut plastic. Um, you know, a lot of times they say don't, don't do it, you know, when it's really cold or during the winter, because then when it warms up in the summer, then it'll be really loose. But I think if you, um, if you allow it to kind of sit out a little bit, and you know and you sit it over your structure it does soften enough where we haven't we haven't really had any any issues with with that awesome well thank you so much mike for agreeing yeah. to come on and share your insights on high tunnel production and thank you all the attendees for logging in and joining us tonight